Welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm Tony Guerra, pharmacist, publisher, and professional editor, bringing you interviews and advice on succeeding in your residency journey. You can sign up for the email list at pharmacyresidencypodcast.com to get your free LOI template or get editing help working one-on-one with me at residency.teachable.com. Let's get started with the show. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Today, we're going to talk about uh, residency dismissals because this is the the time of the year, or it just was the time of the year, uh, where unfortunately those that don't pass the NABPLEX and those that don't pass the MPJE are going to be dismissed from their programs. Uh, Some programs were very kind about this and, you know, you get the second chance. Uh, Sometimes you didn't get the second chance. But I was reading a post on LinkedIn by Sally Treyor Uwalaka, and she says that some of the dismissals are not from the mistake that NABP had, which was, you know, 220 uh, students were either given a a pass when they failed or failed when they passed. And so I wanted to kind of dig into how this could be, uh, that many residents are, you know, unfortunately uh, not able to continue in their residency uh, and then she makes some statements that we can kind of talk about Uh, but I do need to apologize Uh, yesterday I released uh, the wrong podcast well I released the right podcast just in the wrong podcast channel Uh, so I do have a memorizing pharmacology podcast which is uh, I teach pharmacology so I have a, a podcast that um, I use as a, as a way to keep you know the students engaged. Uh, I have an episode every week. So if you're a P1 or P2, or maybe even P3 or P4 who's starting to think about studying for NAPLEX, uh, the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast that uh, you can just play from the beginning, uh, you need to upside down it. So normally podcasts are newest first. Uh, For this, you would actually want to start with the first podcast episode, and it'll basically take you through a pharmacology course uh, as you're going to and from uh, wherever you're getting to. And it's on Apple, too, uh, so uh, wherever you get your podcasts. But so let's talk about this, uh, finding out what it is that happened that causes uh, residents not to get licensed on time. And basically, if you want the rule of thumb, at the three month mark, you have to be uh, licensed so that you can have three quarters as a pharmacist. And when you're talking about the mistake that NABP made, it if the resident stayed there, aside from the mental trauma of being told you, you failed and, and you actually passed, uh, the residency pay does not change. So you actually maintain your your pay. You're not paid as an intern until you get your license and then your your residency pay goes up. I believe it's just split evenly among the 12. They're making the assumption that you're going to uh, become a pharmacist. Uh, Those that um, had to leave residency and got a regular position actually doubled their pay. So in terms of money, it's kind of a really difficult and weird thing because normally if you don't pass the NAPLEX and you don't get your job, you you don't make money, but residents are already making the money. So when you talk about NABP and if, I don't know, I saw in Scott Jelson's post that there was class action. I don't know if that's true or not. I have no no background on that, but uh, if that is class action, you know, what damages can you prove? And you have two very different things. On the one end, it's pain and suffering. And then on the other end, if you weren't in a residency and you were trying to get a job and lost that job opportunity uh, and, you know, lost you know, two months of, of pharmacist salary, that would be, you know, the, the standing and why you uh, uh, had something bad happen. So let's talk about this um, because... Sally says that um, there's there's a talk of the scoring error, but a lot of new grads found themselves in this situation. Uh, is it an impact of remote learning from COVID? And I don't know that that's the case. I'm going to guess that, and I'm going to guess, when I say guess, I'm going to back this up with some data. I think the big thing 
is when you're talking about who's been dismissed, it's because residencies were not getting their top choices. And I want to show you kind of the, the string of events uh, that's happened uh, for that to happen. So uh, let's take a quick look at M NAPLEX pass rates, MPJE pass rates, and then we'll look at what happened with the match. So the NAPLEX pass rates, and I've just blown this up, you know, it's super huge because I know a lot of you guys watch the, the videos on YouTube at Tony Farm D. Please like and subscribe. Uh, that uh, you have these kind of four columns at the end. You have the first attempt, you have the first time pass rate, and then all attempts and all time pass rate. So those that didn't pass will you know reattempt within whatever window they have now this was released in april which is really really late but because of the issue with you know having uh i think it was 400 or more uh incorrect ones and then now 220 uh, that got pushed back from when it used to be which was like right after people got their um, residencies to late april and this is really a concern for a number of reasons. On the pre-pharmacy side, you are applying to pharmacy school with old data. You have no idea how the class that just graduated did on their NAPLEX, and you won't know uh, until you are about to go into school. And by then, you know, can you really apply to another pharmacy school? Yeah, you probably actually could uh, to many in May. Uh, but you would want to check that pass rate uh, in May to make sure that, or late April, uh, to make sure that that's right. So another thing that this NAPLEX pass rate does is it also tells you kind of where the trend is uh, with the School of Pharmacy in terms of enrollment. And so you can kind of see uh, that here we have uh, two schools, just uh, it's always uh, Albany, then Appalachian. Uh, just in the way that they do it. So Albany had 198 first attempts two years, three, well, it would have been three years ago uh, in 2019, and then 195 in 2020, and then 168 in 2021. And you see that that's a really big drop in enrollment. And you're going to see that kind of across the board. Um, but you're going to see that the opposite happens too. So for Appalachian, it was 64, then they grew to 70, and now they're down to 53. And then when you talk about the, uh, um, you know, somewhere like Auburn, they've gone from 146 down to 137, and then back up to 148. So um, in order not to, to embarrass schools and things like that, I'm not going to show the, the left side as I kind of go through these. Uh, but what I do want you to see is that these first time pass rates are, well, let's first see what the overall pass rate is for all the schools. So here we are at the bottom of the document, 84%. Uh, that's the overall or the, the first time pass rate. And then 82% uh, is the pass rate within that window of time. Uh, so again, they could next year, you know, or the year after or outside of the window, uh, retake the NAPLEX uh, however many times and so forth. But when we look at the numbers here, we see some pass rates that are quite low. So you're talking about two out of three passing on their first try. Well, that's pretty stressful because not only did you not pass, but now during residency and under the onus of if you don't pass this second time, you're gone, uh, that's really tough. So down at the bottom we have here uh, three quarters pass, three quarters pass, and then you know seven out of 10. A uh, couple of 70s there. Uh, let's see, another 75, 74, 71, 68. Sounds like I'm preparing to hike a football. Uh, 79, 73, um, and I think there were some that were, were even a bit lower. 75, 72, another 65, uh, let's see, 77, 73, uh, 71, 74, and I think 74, so, uh, ooh, the 53, yeah, that's a bad one. Um, 72. Uh, and then so we can you, you get the picture there's a bunch of 70s here uh, a couple of uh, 60s uh, th that 
55 uh, in there. And so when we talk about pass rates, uh, I think that was the top page, right? No, no, there's a 54% uh, pass rate. So uh, again, we, we have some quite low pass rates uh, when it comes to that, but that's not even the worst of it. Because when you're talking about residency, the big issue is you learn the law and abided by the law in one state, and then you moved to a different state. So that's the real issue. And so now let's look at the MPJE pass rates. Okay. And when we look at the MPJE, we see that the pass rate is only 80%. And so you're saying, all right, so at 84%, I'm rounding down a little bit here, but four out of five will pass. And then with MPJE, four out of five will pass. But those are independent events. Okay, so if you were just to do a strict statistical analysis, you know, the one over, you know, what are the chances of passing both tests, right? That would be four out of five times four out of five. And that's 0.8 times 0.8 or 0.64. So the chances of somebody passing NAPLEX and passing MPJE, strict statistical, not looking at, you know, they got a 95 on NAPLEX, they'll probably pass MPJE. Uh, it's only 64%, so that means two out of three are going to be able to pass both. So when we look at the group that's applying for residency, we'd say, okay, well, you know, I mean, the residency group has been narrowed down. Okay, so when we look at ASHP match stats and we look at what happens when the, you know, the summary here, whoops, that's not what I want. When we look at the summary here, there we go. Okay, and we look at match rates and we'll make this a lot bigger here so, so you can see it. Okay, we see that once we have this first group that comes in, and of the 6,486 PGY1s, 1,000 did not uh, withdrew or didn't return any rankings. So most of the time, that means they didn't get an interview. So now we have 5,427. And so when you're looking at that 1,059, you're saying, okay, well, those that didn't get an interview, maybe they had lower grades, and we're just assuming that they, they probably wouldn't have passed. Uh, they would have passed the NAPLEX and the PJE at a lower rate. So residency applicants should pass the NAPLEX at a higher rate. Now we don't have the, the data to do this, uh, but that's something that we should see, right? Then when you take the number that matched versus those that didn't match, you take out another group, okay? So two out of three basically matched and one out of three didn't. So you've taken out one out of three, you're thinking, okay, well, those are the ones that are probably not gonna um, pass MPJE and pass uh, the uh, NAPLEX. And so if that was perfect, if you did it in such a way that you removed a third of the applicants, well, you could actually remove a third of the people in the NAPLEX and MPJE and, and that would actually work out to be even. So everyone that does residency could mathematically pass the NAPLEX, NAPLEX and MPJE while uh, the rest of the group has, you know, maybe lower rates. And we, we know that's not true. Okay. But the match rate, you know, went up to 77% after you got the interview. It's only about two thirds uh, before, you know, when you're registering for the match that you're gonna make it there. Uh, and then PGY2, obviously at 82%, a bit higher. But here's what happened. Here's why it would make sense that more people are uh, failing uh, as um, Sally Trayer Uwalaka said, is that sh we look at the match stats and we see the big red line here, right? So two years ago, it went from 73.64 down to 73.21. So just a couple of, you know, just a small dip in the number that we're applying. But then 900 fewer people were participating in the match. At the same time of that downward trend, right? We went from 48.14 to 52.32. And so the, the quick math on that is we've gone up 400 positions and we've gone down about 1,000. And so these numbers are coming together. 
So what happens there is that now residencies are not going to get the people that they wanted and ranked higher. Okay, so the data support this. And I gotta do a little uh, internet magic here uh, to put these side by side. But I'll show you the 2018, you know, four, what is it? So four years ago till now, it's just gonna be a dramatic decrease in the number of, in the in how high the ranking is of the people that uh, the residency wanted. So basically the, the, the residencies are not getting the people that they want uh, at the same rate that applicants are getting the people that are getting the residencies that they want. All right, the important thing is that 2022 is on the left and 2018 is on the right. And here's what happened. The, the big number to look at is down here. This is called the ratio of the least preferred match rank to the number of positions filled. What it basically means is <clears throat> if you have, for example, okay, what you need to know is that the lower the ratio, the better it is for the residency. The higher the ratio, the worse it is for the residency. So when we look at this ratio, what we're basically saying is that if you have eight residents and you wanted them to be your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight choice, right? Hey, you have a ratio that says, okay, well, of those choices, where did it go? Okay, did you get what you wanted? So a perfect, a perfect score, if you want to call it that, is let's say uh, a residency ranks eight candidates one two three four five six seven and eight you divide that number by eight and you get one that is the very best that that residency can do okay now what it says is is that how far down the list did you have to go let's say you ranked one through 32 okay if you rank one through 32 that means that 32 divided by 8 makes 4.0. And 4.0 and higher means that you had to go down to your 32nd choice. Okay, And when we look at the data and we see that, okay, in 2018, how often did it happen where you had to go to 4 and higher? 227 times. But when we look at 2022, almost double the number of residencies had to go to that choice and higher okay so again the the numbers in all but one category like they went from 300 down to 249 147 down to 129 262 245 uh, did go a little spike here from 3 to 3.5 but the bottom line is that residencies are not getting their top choices as much so when you're going to Las Vegas and you're talking to residencies and you're like, wow, they seemed awfully nice and awfully interested in me, it's because they really do want to get their top choices. And yes, they're going to be a lot nicer to you. And they don't want to be in the position where they are now where um, the number of positions filled is increasing. Okay, so uh, in 2018, it was 114 for uh, PGY1 in 2022, it was 141. And then for PGY2s, the number of positions that have not been filled has almost doubled uh, from 116 uh, to 224. Uh, and that is uh, a real concern, especially this year, uh, because there, although there are more PG, there are as many actually a few more PGY1s than the year before, um, they are not as preferred as the year before. So because of the, let's go through this in like one big sentence and I'll do the visuals here. So because of the dive and the match trend that we had a thousand fewer applicants, okay, and we had 400 more residency positions, okay, it became easier for applicants to get the residencies they wanted. 
However, someone has to suffer on the other end. And because um, they got what they wanted here at 77% and 82% for PGY2 after they made it through, um, it's the residencies that are suffering, quotation fingers, uh, and I'll just expand this all the way to the 2022 only, uh, in that now the average residency has a ratio of 3.1. Okay, so what does that what does that mean? What does that mean for you? Well, it means that when we look at this number and we talk about that residency that had eight residents in it, and we'll just round it down to, to number three, that means that one of those eight residents was the residency's 24th choice on average. That is not the worst. That is the average residency is going to, with eight people, is going to have their eighth or 24th choice. Now, the average residency maybe only has two or three um, <clears throat> applicants. So it's not terrible. So if you have two applicants, right, and you're going to have three, well, what would that work out to be? So if you want to do the math here, it's quick math. If you have one resident at a site, it's likely that they're going to get their third choice. If you are have two residents, it's going to be there's going to be a sixth choice in there. Third, three residents, you're going to have a ninth choice in there. Twelfth for four, fifteen for five, and so forth. And adds it really would be adding three point one. So. When you talk about eight, I mean, you're really talking maybe a 25th choice with eight, but, you know, that doesn't really matter as much. Okay, so that's on the residency side. So the bigger the residency, the more, the the lower, you know, the ranking that they're probably going to have in there. That doesn't mean that they can't have, you know, this, this eight group could have their first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and 24th. That's just the way the ratio works. Uh, but... Again, residencies, I expect, in this year as and then over the next two years, as enrollment continues to drop, um, residencies are going to go further and further down the list, and the number of non-filled positions are going to increase and increase because there's just a cutoff where they're like, look, we just don't have the applicants that we need. But this document is what you guys really care about, which is, well, in terms of choice, what do you get? So while residencies are going further and further down their list, and that should continue, that trend should continue as the number of applicants go down, as the number of residency positions go up, as you know enrollment uh, drops, and uh, enrollment's dropping again this year, but it's not a ton. I think it's like three or four uh, percent, but still, uh, again, we're we're still going down. But this is what the magic numbers that that you guys want to see, and I'll, I'll bold them here. Um, and maybe easy to do the backward math to say that it works out to be about 90% of the time you're going to get one of your first three choices. That again is if you interview. Okay, so you have to have interviewed uh, and been able to rank. So if you're ranking 58% chance in 2018, 59% chance in 2022 that you're going to get your first choice. About So about 60% for uh, first place, about 20% for second, about 10% for third, and then only a little bit less than 10% that you'll even get your fourth and fifth. Uh, and then this is fifth or higher, really. So in all likelihood, the residency that you get, if you get three places that you're going to rank, that means that 90% of the time, you're going to get one of those three as your as your top choices. So it's just kind of amazing uh, how consistent this has been. I mean, when I looked at the numbers, I was like, really? I feel like it should have changed, uh, but it didn't. Um, so anyway, just really great on your side uh, that you're able to uh, get the residency that you want. But unfortunately, the residencies are going to continue to to not really get what they want. So let's kind of wrap this up, go back to the post that started it all um, with Sally Trayer, Uwalaka. Got to do that name right. Uwalaka. Our residents 
you know, being dismissed at a greater rate. Well, I don't have access to that data. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. As NAPLEX pass rates go down, as MPJE pass rates go down, as the residencies are having to choose and go further down into their rankings, um, you're going to get students that are not as high uh, in ranking and likely have lower grades, likely have fewer activities uh, and so forth. And, you know, again, anecdotally, we're just saying it would make sense that if you are getting weaker candidates and accepting them, then that tail of group uh, is going to have lower NAPLEX and pass rates. Now, the acceptance rate at the pharmacy school was around 82% uh, last year, around 82% this year. The interesting thing will be over the next two or three years, as that pass rate went up to 86 and then 88, and now it's back down to 86, uh, you know, is there going to be an even uh, greater NAPLEX fail? Is there going to be an even greater NPJE? I don't know that it will be because schools have gotten pretty good at making sure that their students are studying uh, for the NAPLEX, but there's not much they could do. Uh, there's actually something they could do, but uh, what they do about the MPJE is that they tend to teach the federal and, you know, good luck. You know, hope you, you do well on the MPJE wherever you're going to go because they're going to all these different states. But, you know, being penny wise and pound foolish, uh, it would make sense for students to uh, purchase. You know, I know TLDR Pharmacy has it, the MPJE, um, for every single state. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the, a, a pharmacy school, you know, kind of reach out on the behalf of uh, their students and like, OK, look, our, our MPJE is absolutely disastrous. Um, you know, we've got these um, where you know, these states where they're really struggling. And so if you just look at MPJE, they have all the cheat sheets for every single state in the union. So I don't get any money from TLDR. But just know that uh, they do have cheat sheets for every single state and that, you know, that, in, that, that first step of getting the studying started, well, it's the cost to fail the MPJE is so much different than 75 uh, that I'll just leave it at that, um, that it, it would make sense to, to do something like that. So. Uh, all right. Well, again, if you need my help, uh, you know, I'm helping others with letters of intent and, and their CVs and making sure that they have their application materials uh, for residency to make sure that they can get the interview, get their first, second, third choice. Uh, so if you want to talk to me, Tony, the pharmacist at gmail.com or go to residency.teachable.com. Hey, thanks for listening. And again, sorry about that uh, pharmacology uh, podcast thing. Uh, I do this at like four and five in the morning. And I'm just exhausted. You know, Thanksgiving's coming up, so I didn't uh, mean to send that out. But if you do want to follow the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast, just throw that into the, the Google search bar and follow it on uh, either, you know, it, it'll always be posted on Tony Farm D, uh, the YouTube channel. But if you just want to get that pharmacology thing, maybe you're a P1 or P2, uh, just go to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast and play them in order, like where it started. Uh, it'll give you an introduction to uh, the big seven, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, respiratory, immune, uh, neuro, cardioendocrine. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, I kind of build on it. Uh, and I'm using what's called an OER book, which is an open educational resource. So uh, if that's helpful, uh, I'd love to know as well. And it really does help. Uh, you know, maybe we don't ever meet. Maybe you don't ever buy something from me or whatever. But the one thing that we really do appreciate is if you do like and subscribe on YouTube. And then if you can write a review, that's awesome. Uh, you know, negative or positive, it just always helps. We do read uh, those reviews. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. You might also like to check out our available residency audiobooks at pharmacyresidencypodcast.com forward slash books, where you can get your first book free if you've never been on Audible before, or work one-on-one -on -one with me as a professional editor at residency.teachable.com. Feel free to send an invite to connect with me, Tony PharmD, on LinkedIn, or email me at tonythepharmacist at gmail.com with questions. Music was by Policy.